Thank you all for coming. Can you hear me all right if I talk without the microphone? Yeah. Does that work for you? Okay. If for some reason you can't, just give me the sign and I'll bring my voice up. If I talk too long, give me this and I'll stop. <laughs> um, my mother is here. She will, she's probably the one who can and we all have to stop. Uh, no laughter out of you either. There's some folks who know me here uh, who know that I, I like to talk. And one of the things I really like to talk about is Paragon Park. And so people ask me the first question they say is, well, wh why are you so interested in it? What is it about it that makes Paragon uh, important to you? And one of the things is really summed up in this picture. Any guesses who that is? Yeah. Yay, there you go. So this picture was taken uh, in July of 1985. Does anyone know what happened in June of 1985? Paragon was auctioned, and uh, we'll get into a lot of the stories about what happened then and what happened to the roller coaster and where it is now. If you would like to visit, you still can. Um, but they were tearing down the roller coaster, and piece by piece. I'm getting ahead of myself, but I want to explain the picture. Um, and the folks who bought it hired a photographer to um, take photos of what it was like when it was here in, at Nantasket Beach. So when they rebuilt it, they would be able to sort of show you know, what it looked like then, what it looked like now, and they've made some modifications to it over the years. Uh, the guy who was the photographer is a guy named Art Milmore. Some of you may know him. I think he's done some talks on, on other topics. Um, and Art happened to call and say, uh, I got a funny assignment and I need someone to hold my camera bag. <laughs> Are you interested? So the first thing I said was, uh, before he even said that, where, where are we going? He said, well, we're going over to the park. Nobody ever called it Paragon. Everyone called it the park, or the park, as we say in Boston. Um, I said, sure, what are we taking a picture of? The roller coaster. OK, why do you need someone to carry your bag on the roller coaster? He said, well, we're climbing the roller coaster. I said, all right, I'm with you, but I'm afraid of heights. And he said, don't worry. We'll have a rope. <laughs> now, what do you, Ma, you're here. What do you think the first thing my mother said was when she saw this picture? You have a rope, but it's not attached to anything. <laughs> and the second thing she said was, did I know you were doing that? Yeah. Uh, the answer is uh, no, you didn't. Uh, but we made it. We made it alive. So we took some photos and we'll get to some of the pictures that we took because one of the great things about the end of the story, this is like sort of giving a talk on the Titanic, right? We all know how the story ends, but we want to hear what happened all the way up there. Um, the roller coaster is still here and as the carousel, as Jean mentioned, the carousel is still here as well. I'm going to talk a lot about that when we get to the end, but before I, we get there, I, I do just want to kind of give a little commercial for the carousel. Um, before I get to the end when you're, you're tired of hearing and you're just, you'll shut down, I want to say it now. Uh, I am on the advisory board for the Friends of the Paragon Carousel. We're a nonprofit. We own the carousel and the, the round building that's around it. Uh, the land under us is leased from the Commonwealth for a dollar a year. The building next door, if you've been down, you've seen the clock tower next door, the old train station. It's also owned by the Commonwealth, also leased for a dollar a year. Uh, we've had a long-term lease there for some time. We are currently without a lease, uh, not from uh, any effort of, uh, not from any lack of effort on our own. Um, the Commonwealth has sort of been a little slower than we'd like to get our lease together. And if, once we get the lease, we can get financing to renovate and do some more restoration. Um, and the Commonwealth won't give us a lease until we commit to restoration. So we're kind of at this point where we both wanted the same thing, but we can't get there. So if anyone knows anyone in state government who can say, get that done, see me afterward. The other reason I love Paragon, the other reason that I'm, I'm really interested in Paragon is because of this guy, uh, my grandfather, Frank Infacino, who, as you can see, is hard at work. <laughs> at Paragon, but actually he is working. Because if you remember uh, the Tunnel of Love ride, it was called the Congo Cruise, the Red Mill, the Bermuda Triangle. When you came around the corner, there was a guy there that stopped the boat and stopped it so that it wouldn't crash into each other as it went up. This was one of his jobs. Uh, he, he also was, this is a horrible picture, but it's only one of the few I can find um, that 
Uh, that's him there working on the track of the roller coaster and his friend Harold. Um, this, I tried to get a picture as close as I could to where he was. Um, but of course, we didn't have the internet then, so I didn't know exactly where he was in that picture. But uh, I kind of liked the fact that we were up there. Um, my grandfather was a guy who worked hard and worked a lot, worked a lot at Paragon. During the day, he was a police officer at night. He worked the midnight to eight shift. He'd get off of that. He'd come back. He'd go work to work at Paragon to get it ready to open at 1 o'clock. Um, that routine was constant. And in his retirement years, when I was young, these were the stories that he would tell. And he would talk a lot about that. And the other thing I'd like to throw out there as my own little public service announcement is um, I, one of my big, big regrets is that I didn't record his stories. I've got them up here, but I don't remember all the details. And at the time, this was 30, 35 years ago, um, you know, I didn't have the pho photography to show him to say, look at, you know, tell me about this. We have that now. So if you're of a generation where you, you've lived through some times where people would want to know, uh, I encourage you to do that, write it down, talk to people about it. If you're younger, there's some younger folks here, um, you know, talk to people who've lived through some things and, and record their memories, either record them on paper or record them video, we can do that now. That video, by the way, um, was not mine. Someone asked if I shot it. Um, I'm not sure wh who did that, but if you think about 35 years ago, what video technology was like, that was a big camera that that guy was holding. And he held on to it right to the very end. Um, the other question is, uh, well, w did you live near Paragon? This is Paragon. This is where I lived. So we were very, very close. And if my mom still lives in this house right here, uh, if you go, and I swear I don't believe in spirits and ghosts, but if you stand in her backyard and the wind blows a certain way, I swear you can hear the roller coaster coming around the corner. Uh, this was the turn. And it would squeak as it went by, and people would scream. Um, and people were playing golf underneath, miniature yeah. golf. Did anyone remember playing that? Yeah. And those people would scream too because the roller coaster <laughs> went right by them. By the way, I meant to ask this before we started. Who, did anyone work at Paragon? Did anyone have a, what'd you do there? So, really, of what? Uh, that building right there. Right here? No, over. Bring it over this way. Little, along here. Along here. So that was food stands, shooting galleries. shooting galleries, yeah. And there was a. I ran the shooting gallery. The story was they used to use real bullets. Is that true? <laughs> Anybody else? There was someone in the back. Oh, Joseph. So was that when the Lahajas ran it? You said. That's the Lahaj's house is right there, yeah. Just, it just sold. Miss, Miss right there. Which one? On Park the Avenue? Back on the last hill, the house was going up. That's it. Kaz's house was the one. That Kaz's house was the next one. Mr. Willis. Yes. Ah, OK. <laughs> the old neighborhood is back. OK. So let's talk a little bit about Paragon. What was there before, why it is what it was. This is what Nantasket Beach looked like a long time ago. Uh, this is the area where Paragon was, or is, or, or used to be. Nothing, absolutely nothing. Um, before this photo was taken, this is from about 1900. And the reason I know it's 1900 is that from here, all the way down here used to be filled with hotels, uh, bars, um, houses of ill repute. Uh, whatever you can imagine, any kind of deviltry and all that sort of stuff was all located there. There was a uh, movement afoot by some summer people who lived up on the hills and, in the vi and some people in the village to sort of clean up Nantasket Beach. They didn't, wanted, um, they didn't like the fact that it was becoming um, sort of downtrodden and they petitioned the state in 1899 to take Nantasket Beach. So if you go to Nantasket Beach today, and you see the entire front, all of this is just tar parking lots. The reason it's that way is, is traced back to 1899 when all this land was taken by the state, everything was cleared off of it, and the only thing that was left was this hotel which has, was there from the 1800s and lasted into the 1950s. Um, but that's why it looks the way it looks. 
because the state took it and tried to clean it up. Now, there's a longer story that you'll read in, in the book that I'm writing. It's almost finished, my, it's almost done, I swear. <laughs> about how they moved the, all the amusements over to uh, an area in Hull called Sunset Point. It was called Nantasket Point at that time. It didn't work out. The people didn't want to travel that far. They wanted to come back here. So one of the great things about this is that this, all this land was taken by the state, but you can't really tell, but this is Nantasket Avenue, and across the street was owned by the railroad. For some strange reason, we don't know why, because it was 100 and something years ago, that land was not taken by the state and it was left to the railroad. So what ended up happening was people who wanted to have amusements here at Nantasket leased the land from the railroad and built, this is what's called a steeplechase. At that point, at that time, um, if you have read anything about Coney Island or places like that, the steeplechase was basically a fun house. It was, the main ride was people on horses on a metal track that went around, and then there were other things like um, you know, the floor would move when you'd walk, or the, they would blow air on you to try to make it fun, you know, to make you look scared. Um, a, a fun house. And then an old mill, basically like the, like the Red Mill, Bermuda Triangle, Congo Cruise Ride. They started building these things, and people started coming back. And they realized that this was something that was very uh, lucrative, and that there should be something a little bit bigger. So what ended up happening was the idea for a larger, amusement park became uh, what people wanted. They wanted to have something a little bigger where there's sort of controlled chaos. It was around a, a, a wall around it. What I think is funny is the next slide you'll see, um, they <laughs> spared no expense in the postcard department <laughs> because they didn't do anything but change the name from entrance to Paragon <laughs> and entrance to Seaplechase. I thought that was great. I mean, we're all Yankees. We all like to save a few bucks. Don't take any new pictures. Uh, and then this is the Nantasket Hotel that was there. This photo is from about the 50s. Um, some of you may remember that. That was there until about 1955. And the reason I know that is that my grandfather, here he comes again, uh, was uh, helped, or he didn't help, but when they went to tear down uh, the hotel um, with a lot of the other folks from home, they would salvage some of the the material and they, uh, he built a shed in our backyard that had the windows and the floorboards and all that uh, from the old hotel. So that was kind of neat. I tried to get it declared a historic building but was not successful. One other thing, um, okay, so the guy who built it, the guy who built it, has anyone seen the musical? Gene mentioned the musical. It's a great show, wasn't it? Um, George Dodge, George A. Dodge is the guy who built Paragon Park. He was not from Hull. He was a friend a neighbor of the guy who built the steeplechase. And uh, the story is that the uh, person who owned the steeplechase was, it was successful for a while, but he ran out of money. He needed another investor. And George Dodge was a whalebone, um, he sold whalebone. He was not, uh, if you saw the movie, if you saw the show, they, they sort of took a little poetic license with it, which was kind of cool. Um, they said he was a whaling captain and he traveled the world and he wanted to bring back all those experiences to the amusement park. Not really, he did travel, but he was not a whaling captain. He sold the, the, the pieces that came from the whaling part. He wasn't the actual whale captain, but that's where he made a lot of his money. So he helped and bailed out his friend and realized that this was gonna be something big. This is not what ended up being built, but this is what the design was. And that building that we saw that had the steeplechase, was right there. The other neat thing, or the other interesting thing about that land taking that I talked about in 1899 was, what, because it was so horrible there and there was all this illegal liquor selling, uh, they banned sales of alcohol within 400 feet of what they called the Nantasket Reservation. Um, so when you look at this map, basically this, this is kind of fanciful, but Things were there. There were, there were buildings along here. There was a lagoon here. There was a tower. And this is the, um, it's the Palm Garden, which is like a, um, the reception area, the, the place that you would have an outing, the place that you would go for dinner and dancing. And how many feet do you think it is from the street? 410. So they had, because when I looked at this, I said, what, what's going on back here? Why is, everything all towards the back, and that's why. They had to get around it somehow. 
Uh, and the hotel that was on the back, we'll see it next, is uh, the Rockland House. If you, I did this talk in Hull, and someone said, where was that? And I said, uh, have you ever driven on Rockland House Road? It was right there. Uh, there was a, there's also an Atlantic House Road and a few others. But this, is, um, this was a summer hotel, believe it or not, that was, it existed before Paragon, but the folks who bought it, George Dodge, realized that people, he needed to have an audience. He needed to have, a lot of parks were built around the country and around the state by trolley companies or railroad companies. To have, a, you know, they wanted people to travel and they needed a place for them to go. So they built these sort of amusement parks or they would build a, an aquarium or a museum of some kind at the end of the line so that you would get on the trolley line and go there. This didn't happen. The railroad existed, the trolley lines existed, but he knew he needed a hotel. He needed something for people to come and stay. And this was the type of place where people stayed a week, a month maybe. Uh, sometimes the family stayed here and uh, the, the husband at that time was probably the one who worked in Boston and would take the train or the steamboat back into Boston while the family stayed here. So that's on the top of the hill behind it, right here. And then the next one, oh, I'm going too fast, is a view from the top looking down. So this is what actually was built. It's a real photograph. It's an actual picture uh, taken from the porch. If you are familiar with Hull at all, familiar with Nantasket, um, Park Avenue, it's the only street in Hull named for Paragon. Uh, I just met, I laughed when I do this in Hull. We talk about you know Rockland House Road and all. There's no Paragon Street or anything. There is Park Avenue, which if you've been there is no no great shakes, but it's there. Uh, the electric tower. One of the other things that happened at this time. So this is 1905 when Paragon was opened, and the electric lights were um, not common in homes then. They were still a new technology. And one of the things that happened was amusement parks and places like this were places where people tested out or displayed new technology. So the fact that there was an electric tower here with lights was a demonstration of what electric lighting could do, technology. In fact, there's another little tidbit about Hull that the first baseball game played under lights was done in Hull, and the reason for it was not anything to do with baseball. It was to demonstrate that you could have electric lights, that they would last for a certain amount of time, that they wouldn't get overly hot, that you could have that technology. So some of the attractions here were different types of things. If you Google or look up um, some of the attractions that were in places like Coney Island, they had um, um, incubators with, with babies in them. And people go, oh my God, what are they doing? This is hard. You know, they're putting them on display. But what they were really doing was showing the technology because you, you didn't travel. You didn't fly. You, you would either take the train somewhere or take a ship somewhere. You didn't get around a lot. So you didn't see that sort of stuff. And even though it was under the guise of entertainment, uh, they were bringing you that technology. And so they had a lot of, uh, of great architecture. They wanted to make it look nice. Um, I think that looks a little like Disney, but I can't, I can't trace Disney here. There's, I've been trying, trying and trying. Um, they also had at one point the, um, their own cabaret troupe. So these are the early, early days. This is uh, right around the turn of the century. And one of these photos, I don't know if I have another one in here. Um, it's amazing when people start to look in their, their photos. There was, well, someone mentioned the, the Lahages uh, saltwater taffy. Do anyone remember Lahages saltwater taffy? So I happened to be interviewing and talking to one of the La members of the Lahage family, and I was more I was totally interested in what they're you know I couldn't get the saltwater taffy recipe, I couldn't get the frozen custard recipe as much as I tried, um, but one of the things that they said offhand just said, well you know my grandfather on the other side, not the Lahaj side. Uh, was the talent booker for uh, the early days of Paragon. I said, really, what do you mean? He said, oh, he had a scrapbook. And they pulled, she pulled out these pictures, this is one of them, of these unbelievable notes on the side written by George Dodge, written by some of these people of the talent that they brought here. It was just an amazing thing that had been just sitting in an in a attic for a long time. It's the inside of the Palm Garden. I should have mentioned, um, so I'll mention in a little bit, um, where the, the ownership goes, but George Dodge is, is um, he had investors and he was trying to 
uh, keep the park afloat. It wasn't financially successful at first, but he had enough money that he kept it going. So I'll go through these a little bit because this is before any of us remember, but a lagoon in the middle um, with an, the electric tower, and that's a bandstand where people would, um, come, where the band would play so that you could hear it all around. Um, and the one thing to look at um, is these, this type of architecture here, this type of railing, you'll see how long that lasted. It's amazing to me that that was visible right up until the 60s in its, in its own way. Um, taken from the Palm Garden looking <coughs> outward at the lagoon. So they, one of the things in the show, in the play, they talked about how they brought uh, folks from different countries. From uh, One of the main stars was from Italy. He was a gondolier, I think I said that right. Um, who came from Italy. They actually did bring people from uh, all over the country, all over the world, to, again, like Ep the best thing I can come up with is Epcot. Um, when you go there, you experience other countries. You didn't have the opportunity to go to Italy, you know, unless you had a lot of money and had a lot of time to get on a boat and go there. So they brought that to you. Um, the, you know, scenes from the Orient, you know, the dragon boats. Uh, the Great Buddha, um, this is some sort of gunnery, I'm not sure what that is. Um, Fair Japan is the, the, you know, the, so they were bringing culture, as much as you could call this culture, to you. One of the other things too, the Johnstown flood, there was a, um, remember now, this is 1905, so radio, not around, uh, TV, not around, interweb, not around. Um, so one of the ways that pe the, the way that people heard about things was either through the, n the newspaper or they would go somewhere and people would, you know, the town crier, we've heard of the town crier, that actually was legit. People would go there and they would listen to someone telling them what happened in the news. There was, um, you can't really read it, oh, you can read it right there, Johnstown Flood. There was a, uh, the, the best example I can draw is Hurricane Katrina that, w is, is, that we would know about um, happened. And you know you don't have photos, you don't have pictures, you don't have descriptions. There was a show, and again, it's not to exploit entertainment, but it's a way for people to understand what happened, where it would be talked and talked about and acted out on stage. And it wasn't just here. This, the Johnstown flood was something that went around to different amusement parks all over the country. Uh, the Klondike. You want to experience? I mean, this is you know sort of. Every little piece of, of, the, of the world is here, um, listening to the bands on the top of the, of the Palm Garden. Um, so one of the things that, that changed the way Paragon was known uh, was there was always, so there were two things, two things I have to say. There was always a roller coaster at Paragon, there was always a carousel at Paragon. Not the same ones that we know today. Um, and one other thing too, so this is one of the, the fun things, people are here, you enjoy history, you must enjoy history, so you must enjoy research. We have, as we researched Paragon, we had interviews with people, especially around the time that Paragon closed in 1985, or the fact that it was sold in 1985, including from the owner himself, who was not a great steward of his own history, talking about how Paragon has been around since 1862, the Civil War, and it was originally called the Atlantic Park, and it was owned by the railroad and, and the Schlitz Brewery. So it took all that, researched everything, called the Schlitz Brewery, got the railroad records, no Atlantic Park, no Schlitz Brewery, no railroad, no 1862, nothing. The, the confusion came about, we found later, or I'm now putting out, that for some reason George Dodge, there's his signature, um, called his company the Atlantic Park Company. I don't know why. If he hadn't done that, it would have saved us so much trouble. But, <laughs> It, the Atlantic Park Company owned Paragon Park. So there were no, there wasn't two, there was one. So I have to point that out. Um, but they built, so this was the fire in 1911 was the, really the first time that something happened. So only six years into the venture, fire breaks out and destroys a, a very good portion of the park. And they build this new roller coaster. So now the roller coasters are getting bigger. They're, people are starting to, the technology is getting better for roller coasters and they're really starting to like them now and they want them higher, they want them longer, they want them faster. So this was built right up at the front of the park. So this is taken from the back looking forward. The roller coaster was put right out front, right out on the street. There's a carousel, not the one we know now, but a carousel. 
And this is taken from the beach. So, so the roller coaster is prom uh, right there in front. Um, and it was actually called the Green Streak Roller Coaster. Um, the person who operated it was a guy named Herbert Schmeck. And the reason we know about that is um, that he becomes very important in a few minutes. Uh, the Rose Standish was one of the steamboats. There were many steamboats that operated in Hull, uh, Nantasket, back and forth, and Pemberton Point. They all basically look the same. They look very similar to this. And as you can see, they're very crowded. People wanted to come and spend the day. Um, everyone know where Hull High School is? Yeah. New turf field going in. Um, this is right on the site of Hull High School. And if you are familiar with anyone, uh, great hot dogs at Pemberton Pier, right at the very end. Uh, Coleman Stand, there you go. It's called something different now, John. You're showing your age. Um, a lot of my stuff revolves around food. But that's, the, that's Pemberton Pier right now. So it's hard to look, it's hard to judge if you were to drive down there. You actually would be driving on the street, would be, it, it would cross through this, this big building. Because remember, they weren't building it for cars. They were building these things for, maybe there is a car there, but horse and buggy would come to the back. But behind this was the railroad station. The reason this is here is that George Dodge um, had some money, started to make some money. He had sold off the Rockland house behind Paragon on the hill and bought the Pemberton and owned it at the time um, that he died, which was in the 20s, uh, because he wanted to create another experience. So people would come on the boats, they would come to the Pemberton, get off at Pemberton, stay in the hotel for a while, come down to, the, to uh, Nantasket Beach on the train, and then come back to Pemberton. Five years later, there's another fire. Now this one is huge. This takes out everything you see. The old roller coaster is barely standing. Uh, the carousel, the building is here. You, it, you can't see it from the other side, but it's completely destroyed. And there, this was all stuff. Remember, there was all stuff there. So if he were to have packed up and said, forget it, I'm out, you would understand. But he didn't. What he did was, instead, he built a stone front entrance that wasn't going to burn. So in 1917, this opened. The one important part about this is that it created Hilarity Hall. I think this is before most of our times. Hilarity, anyone on Hilarity Hall? No, OK. Um, very similar to the steeplechase that would have the old, um, you'd slide down in the, in the burlap sack down, this, down into, the, um, into the pit. Um, and you would do all of these sorts of things. But the other thing that was built, oh, the roller skating rink, too. So I know some of you remember the roller skating rink right in here. Later on, it was Henry's, it was Toyorama, it was the uh, video arcade in the, in the 80s. Um, there was also a roller skating rink. It was also a dance hall. Well, that was the other big thing that people did here it was the dance hall. And that's the building here. You remember those arch windows. You'll see them across uh, Nantasket Avenue. But the other thing that happened here is now we're beginning to build an even taller roller coaster. So in 1917, the giant coaster, as it was called, not the Comet, and we'll talk about why people thought it was the Comet very shortly, was the tallest, not the longest, but the tallest roller coaster in the world in 1917. Revere Beach, the guy built the one in 1920 that was taller. Um, but for those, that three year period, tallest roller coaster around. Um, because now people were beginning to get into sort of a thrill ride. They wanted more and more uh, adventure, more excitement. And they started coming in cars. You think parking is bad now? <laughs> I, don't, I still don't know how these guys have got out. I mean, they're just, no, there's just chaos here. This was one of my summer jobs, was the parking lot. My boss would have gone crazy if he saw this. But the big thing here to remember now is we talked a little bit earlier about people would come for the week, come for the month. Well, now they're coming in cars. And they're, the, the thing about that is that they're packing up and they're leaving that day. Because they're, the one thing that cars did was it opened up tourism to areas that previously didn't really get a lot because they didn't have a train line or a trolley line or something that was easy access. There was a great, um, does anyone remember Hurley's Bathhouse? Um, Hurley's Hurdlers, the carousel, they were in Revere as well. Um, John Hurley was a guy who uh, had a lot of amusements in, diff in both Nantasket and Revere. There's a great quote from him that will be in the book, well, I'm telling you. Um, 
that the automobile is a wonderful thing. It can bring people to the beach, but what we never considered was that it can also bring them away from the beach and bring them somewhere else. So this is why people say, well, why didn't these hotels, like the Nantasket Hotel, why didn't they last? What happened? How come it didn't, it didn't um, stay? And it was because people didn't have to stay so long anymore. They had a way to come for the day, turn around, and then go back home. So the, t the coming of the automobile helped a lot of tourism areas. It didn't help Nantasket Beach sustain itself. We had to turn it around a little bit. But as things happen, you have to go with the flow, right? You have to do what, what technology tells you. And so this was a part of Paragon on the, um, par on the Park Avenue side called the Auto Gate. And there, these are old buses from the 20s, I'm assuming. Um, and you could, park, you could bring your car in like a valet service and they would park your car for you because that's how people were coming now. So they had to even buy into it. They had to take some space out of, their you know, out of the park to cater to the car automobile crowd. Okay, so 1919 to 1923. George Dodge at one point had gotten into uh, another business. He opened a hotel in Park Square in Boston. Um, he was kind of one of the, we'd call him today like a serial entrepreneur. He always started new businesses. He started a um, film company because movies now were starting to become popular. Um, so one of the things that he did was uh, close down his, he had to close his hotel in Boston because of prohibition that would hap uh, came around in 1919. Um, and he leased the park, he still owned the park, but leased it to two gentlemen. One was David Stone, the other was Albert Golden. Uh, around these parts, Albert Golden is probably better known for the Black Rock House. Does anyone remember the Black Rock House? That was Albert who owned that. Um, he was a partner with David, and they leased the entire operation from George Dodge. Uh, again, they didn't buy it, they, they owned it. George still owned it, and also owned the Pemberton Hotel. But George, um, was, became ill in 1922. He also was the candidate, or the nominee, I should say, the Republican nominee for state rep for Hingham and Hull, and became very ill in, in the summer of 1922, and he died in September of 1922, still owning Paragon. So his wife and his family, his children didn't want to own it, they didn't want to take it over, they wanted to sell it to, to Albert Golden and David Stone. They went to go, there was a, some property that they had to, to get uh, agreement from the railroad. Remember, they were building it on the railroad land. Um, and in the process of doing that, in March of 1923, Paragon went up in smoke. The entire thing burned. The stone entrance that he thought didn't, wasn't gonna burn, it burned. They lost everything. But. God bless them. David Stone and Albert Golden said, well, we're committed. We're going to do it. And they, they kept it. They stayed. The, the, this is a photo from up on the hill of the fire. There was so much, it was so cold that it froze a lot of the houses. And the fire department reported that that was one of the reasons why there was not more destruction. If you look on the uh, Hull Fire Department's website, March 29th, 1923, it, they say that it's the, the most damaging fire in the history of Hull. And it started right here in Paragon Park. Um, and the other thing that was very interesting was um, it got so bad that the, if you know the geography of Hull a little bit, Atlantic Hill is up behind Paragon, uh, heading this way. Um, they were ready to uh, blow up dynamite, use dynamite to blow up houses to stop the, the spread of fire. Didn't have to do that, but they were ready to do it. So in the aftermath of this, uh, the, I, should, I should stop. The roller, I said everything was destroyed. The roller coaster was not completely destroyed. It was one of the few things that was still there. But the carousel that was there was one of the things that was destroyed. And so this is the carousel we now know today. This is when it was in Paragon still. It was built in 1928 by the Philadelphia Toboggan Company. Um, and there, it's very rare to have an intact carousel from that period still today. I think that there are only about a dozen or so that are left that haven't been broken up. So the fact that we have it here is still a great thing. 
Uh, the interior, the other part of the, of the carousel that makes it very rare is these Roman, they're called these Roman chariots. There are two of them. And there are 66 horses and two Roman chariots, which is, again, something that's very uh, unique and, and very rare. The Philadelphia Toboggan Company still exists. They still build roller coasters. They built coasters and um, carousels, but they stopped building carousels in the early 1930s when the Depression hit. And this carousel is number 85. They numbered them from one to whatever. They stopped building them at about, 19, at about 90. So we were one of the last ones built by them. And, I, and that's, according to the story, that's one of the reasons that there are all of these elements, because they kind of knew that they were winding down their business a little bit, and they wanted to create something that was going to be memorable. And we got to benefit from that. Um, so later, there were some, some damage, some fire damage that, that had to be repaired. And they built this kind of gaudy, orangey, yellowy entrance in the front. Uh, that was built in the 30s. It lasted until, we'll see in a little bit, uh, the mid-50s. But I love these cars. Um, Lahages right here. Uh, Joseph's, I think, was on the other side of this, if I'm not mistaken. Is it? OK. Good. Aerial view from the late 40s. So the hotel is still here. Um, one thing that I wanted to point out, too, so this is the, ho this is the coaster that we now know. This is the, the, the giant that we remember when we go talk about Paragon. This little piece here uh, is the back turn. There was a, a circular turn that was built in the original. We'll see later that it was, um, it was part of, a victim to a fire, but has been rebuilt as part of it in Maryland. Along here, you can't really see it that well, but um, this is the building that still exists. This is the only part of Paragon that is still there. Um, it was, at the time, we'll talk about it, it wasn't owned outright by the folks who owned Paragon, but originally it was part of, the, of Paragon. It's where the La Restaurant is. Um, there used to be carousels and ships, Core Brothers, the Penny Arcade. Anyone play Fascination? Uh, it's all right there. That's the only piece of Paragon still left. There's also a section here in the back that housed uh, the Turnpike car ride, if anyone remembers that. It's the only piece of Paragon left that hasn't been built on. Uh, a couple other things to note. Uh, so we're still at Hilarity Hall. There's Joseph's right there. You can see the sign there. Carousel right in the middle. Uh, Funland was another little amusement park that was off to the side. People thought they were connected, but they weren't. They were actually competitors. Um, one of the other spots, oh, so then Hilarity Hall and um, the Dance Hall. And the Harridan House is up about here. Still there. OK, so what did we look like in the 50s? Remember I said look at those, look at those um, things? They're still there. Now, they filled in the, the lagoon here. Uh, because as, as people were getting more and more interested in the rides, and there started to be more and more traveling rides, or, or they would switch out the rides as they went. The Lindy Loop was something you sat in, and it spun you around as you went around the circle. Uh, but remember, the tall roller coaster, the penny arcades, these were in buildings that sort of still had some remnants of what it used to look like. Um, but as we saw, the, as things would burn and as, the, as fires would happen, in the rush to kind of get back to where they needed to be, they didn't get very creative with the architecture. So, I mean, this sort of slab top, you know, stucco face, it's really not uh, as grand as the old stuff used to look like. Um, and so one of the things that leads up to where we, we, we end is deferred maintenance. Um, there wasn't a lot of money to um, keep Paragon looking the way it was. This is, uh, again, there's that lagoon that's filled in. And the other thing I should note is the carousel, where it is in the middle, was right in the middle of the lagoon. So they were, they were building on it. I think by now it's totally covered. I don't think there's any section left. Um, but this little kitty section was uh, an area that was one of the things that Paragon did throughout its history was uh, part of all of the rides, of, like the roller coaster, the big ones, were owned by the same people who owned Paragon. But they would lease out sections. Uh, my cousin, or a cousin of cousins, if you do the family tree, uh, one of the Infocinos ran the kitty park. Uh, and that's where my uncle worked um, and some of uh, the other family members. So we, all, we had a, a definite connection 
They still did have a little bit of a lagoon, but as you can see, it kind of needs some work here. Um, so, you know, a lot of deferred maintenance, a lot of things that needed to be worked on, but still trying to kind of capture the old uh, history there. Shows, so then we still kept the live shows. The Flying Willendas were part of the show. They were high diving acts. They were people that, um, you know, death defying leaps and all those sorts of things. Uh, but this was one of the things you could always catch a free show there uh, throughout. One of the things that Paragon did early on was um, it charged an admission fee in the 20s. In the 30s during the Depression, they stopped doing that because people just didn't have money. Um, so they went on this idea that you would come in for free because they were hoping you would spend money on the games and on tickets and on food and all of those sorts of things. So these shows were going on and they were just there to watch. So you could walk through. And that's one of the great things about being a kid is you got to walk through the park every day. Uh, in fact, my mother will tell you, um, we were, our rule was we lived on the top of the hill and to get to the beach you could walk down the hill, but we had to walk through the park because that made them feel safe. What I now know as an adult is that's where all the crazy people were. So I'm not sure exactly what went into that thinking, but at least there were people we knew there, I guess, right? Uh, this is one of the great things. I'm not sure I have this kid's name, but one of the great things I talked about people who were pulling stuff out of their attic and showing it to you. I just love this picture. I think it's great. I think this summarizes the whole experience of um, what Paragon was. Um, go there as a kid, get it. I think he's got an ice cream, or it could be a hamburger, I'm not sure. Um, but one of the things, so the, the book title, When Summer Meant Everything, some people do ask me that, where did you get that from? Um, and there's, it's a long story, but I'll tell you the very short piece of it was, uh, I interviewed someone who was a documentary filmmaker who, um, the Thin Blue Line, if you remember that documentary. Um, he worked on that. There were a couple others. He was a summer house in Hull, grew up here, knew Paragon, loved Paragon. Came around with a camera and started videoing, uh, interviewing people just on the street when Paragon announced it was closing. And so he put all, he was gonna make some kind of documentary or some kind of a, he didn't know exactly what he was gonna do. Um, and he ended up putting that all in storage and he lived in New Jersey. I tracked him down, I talked to him, I was hoping to get you know, some, uh, some of the, to look at some of the material. Um, it ended up that, that he passed away before I could uh, do that. But in our conversations, he said he was kind of one of these guys that kind of never grew out of the hippie stage, you know, and he talked like this. And I said, well, what did you remember about, you know, what, what was, why was Paragon magical to you? What a, it's like, man, that was the time, you know? That's when summer meant everything. And I went, oh my God, that's the title of the book right there. <laughs> of course, I didn't tell him that because he would want a royalty. <laughs> but, we'll, but we credit him. We, we mentioned it in the introduction. Don't worry. So OK, fire was always a problem. Always a problem. Imagine getting your paper in the morning and looking at this. Um, Hilary Hall, gone. Another blizzard. Um, and Paragon, it doesn't, wasn't just threatened, it was burning. Uh, this was 1955. Joseph's was destroyed. Poor Joseph's, it's been through a lot. Uh, it's still there, or actually I shouldn't say that. They uh, retired this year, the family that owned Joseph's. Uh, this is the last year that Joseph's wasn't there. Uh, but again, this caused some changes and, and some of the things that what, what we were doing and how the park was done. And the buildings that, that were built, again, just didn't have that same magic that they did. But one of the questions we always get is, so I talked a little bit about Epcot and Disney. Well, how, did, how was, did, did these sort of parks influence Disney? And I think every history of an amusement park, you'll, they'll say, well, this was the inspiration for Disney. I know it. I just know it was. I don't know that it was. But Disney certainly had an effect on these parks. And this is one of the things that we can look at. So this is an ad from the late 1950s talking about the rides, the Magic Mine Train, the Crazy Cups. Uh, the zigzag, the Himalaya, anyone remember the Himalaya? Turn it up faster, turn it, go faster. Who, uh, they used to say that, the, the ride operator would go, who wants to go faster? I mean, it was going the same speed every time. <laughs> but he would yell, who wants to go faster? And people would go, yeah, me. Um, the animal safari, all kind of, the boa constrictor, the ocelot, uh, the turnpike ride, again, that was the other big one that was out there. But look at this, rides like California's land of fantasy couldn't name Disney in an app, 
but in the in the park itself, yeah. Disneyland type jungle ride, uh -huh. Disneyland type turnpike ride. Uh -huh. Anyone remember these boats? These were awesome. They were, it's the simplest ride you ever see. It's boats on a on a pole going around in water, and kids loved it. <laughs> loved it. All the night. So this is the turnpike ride. Um, and there's a guy, I tried to track him down. Again, I could, I, you lose these, track of these people who actually was restoring one of these cars. But this is still here. So this is the, the mine train. This is the, the ride, not the actual railroad. But this was part of, long story again, this was part of the old railroad bed that they bought when the railroad went out of business. That one of the only sections in Hull that is owned, privately owned. But it still exists. If you go down there today and look behind, so this is all condominiums now, um, and there's, this is all overgrown, but, and these, these railings are gone, but this cement track is still there, and I don't have this picture, but at the other end, there's a building, it's got two garage doors in the front, and they painted it the same color as the building next door, but it doesn't belong to those people. It was the garage for these. Um, it's still there. Um, this is actually going to be, if you've read, in, uh, there was a story in the ledger about an art walk that they're building. Um, there's a, they're, they're making a, a walkway from the old parking lot across into the beach, and they're going to put in, this is the land that they're using to put the art walk in. But this is the only piece of Paragon that has not yet been built on. I remember the, the zoo. We've got the old baboon. <laughs> Climb the old roller coaster. Yeah? No, that's not a fake. That's real. Anyone remember going to the midget wrestling? Can you say midget wrestling? I'm on cable now. I don't know if I can do that. Um, but we've got, I mean, this was one of the things that um, Paragon became known for in the late 50s and 60s. So that front building that we talked about, the, um, in the winter, so, so they had to come up with some ideas. So the Stone family owns Paragon. David Stone's son, Larry. We'll talk about Larry in just a minute. Larry was born in 1919. You remember when David Stone took over? 1920. So he literally grew up in Paragon, never had another job, never knew anything but his family owning an amusement park. Came up with an idea in the winter, what do we do to earn some money in the winter? They turned the skating rink into a um, toy store for the summer, uh, for the winter, sorry. And then Funland turned around and created a toy uh, toy store in their section called the Arcade Bazaar that would compete back and forth with them. And one of the guys I talked to who worked there said they always would try to be five cents less than each one, um, but it never quite worked out. But fascination, excuse me, fascination still there. The Penny Arcade building is still here. So this is, if you drive down to Nantasca today and look, the building is in horrible shape and it's a travesty that it's in bad shape. But you can see this distinctive design. It's still there. Uh, that's from 1917. It's one of the oldest buildings um, on, in Nantasket, not in Hull, but in the Nantasket section. The oldest building in Nantasket is the police barracks that was part of the old hotel. OK, so these two, oh, no, that one, just that one. So I, I point this out only because uh, Paragon had a tilt-a-whirl. That was definitely one of the rides that was there. But remember we talked about Funland? This is actually from Funland. And one of the problems with the internet is um, the in incorrect information. We talked about Atlantic Park being part of it. You'll see this all the time, and they'll say that this is from Paragon. This is actually from Funland, because Paragon did not have uh, that big Ferris wheel that's there the way it is. OK, so three fires in 1963. So there were in, again, this is the, the fire is what's causing all of the changes here at Paragon. The big one, again, there's Port Joseph's. Those, those guys are just. <laughs> The worst luck you ever have in the world. But they've been around so long, that's why. Uh, so there were three fires in 1963. The first one was at Funland itself. The, the large building in the back burned down, the Arcade Bazaar burned down. The second one was at the front entrance, that, that orangey kind of entrance that we showed, uh, burned completely, and that's where Joseph's is here. Also damaged that back section of the roller coaster that we talked about. So you can see it, this is all gone. So this was all taken out. Um, and one of the things that happened in the end, we, we saw that roller coaster video at the beginning. And if, how many people rode the roller coaster, by the way? I should have asked this. 
All right, how many people had their hands up? All right, there you go, two of them up. How many people were holding on like this? When you got to the end, do you remember that it was like kind of jerky, it was around like this? The reason is that this section, it used to go further. So here, it used to go around and back and then come in. But in order to get ready, this fire was on Easter Sunday of 1963. In order to get ready for the summer season, they didn't open it until the 4th of July, they just stopped it. So this is where it would have been. So they just turned it to go right back into the cars. That's why it felt like you were getting jerked around because it wasn't built that way. So now I can tell you that in, in Maryland, when they redid this, so they went back to the original design and they found the, the, the drawings for that old section that burned, this whole section back here. And they rebuilt the, the ride. They had a lot of land down there and you know, not just sort of jammed in the way we were. And they built it. Uh, what do we know about that? Um, believe it or not, they don't believe that they were arson. They believe that they were, one of them was, you know, paint cans left in the sun. Uh, one of them was actually an electrical transformer exploded. Um, some of them, they just, they don't know. And this, the newspaper stories always say, we're going to find who's responsible and bring them to justice, and they never did. <laughs> just never happened. Uh, but they did investigate, that, I should say though, they, were, they did investigate several times the owners to see if it was an insurance you know, kind of thing, like, oh, this ride's getting a little old, let's burn it. No, it didn't happen. Uh, but again, as we're looking along here, um, that's, that's the road, that's the piece I was telling you about with that little garage out in the back there, that's still there. And does anyone remember Burger King? Yeah. The only seasonal yes. Burger King? Yeah, people were talking about that. Okay, so. How did we open? We opened in the 60s with no front entrance. They had a double Ferris wheel. There's Joseph's, God bless them, there they are. Uh, and then the front, so this is the way Paragon sort of looked towards the end. Uh, this was 1963 that the, that the park opened. It didn't have that elaborate front entrance that it normally did. The architecture was not very um, fancy the way it was. There's the Lahages with the saltwater taffy. You'd go by in the, the Machines would string and it would go and then they would have the little thing that would that would package them and send them down the road um, The machines the Lahajas still had those machines uh, to this day I don't know what happened to them, but I know some of the signs uh, Have been donated to the carousel museum and that's the other thing I did me I meant to mention is that next door to the carousel in that building that we're still trying to get the state to lease to us um, We have a small museum. We have a, a place you can buy ice cream, but then there's also a small museum that started out because people just didn't know what else to do with the stuff that they had. And they bring it to us and we put it on display and we catalog it and we keep it. Um, and then there's also the workshop for James Hardison, we'll see him in a minute, who restores the carousel horses. But one of the things is if you have anything like that that you just don't know what to do with, bring it down. Uh, it's a volunteer run museum, so you know, I can't tell you when it's gonna be open. Uh, we try to open it on the weekends you know, from 11 to five, but if, you know, so-and-so gets sick, we, we don't often have someone there. But it's great, you can share your memories, you can read what other people have written about their memories and see some of the great stuff that people have brought. There's Joseph's, you gotta love Joseph's, the inside of Joseph's. <coughs> Blueberry pie was only 15 cents, clam chowder was only 40 cents, love it. The Blue Bunny, uh, this was a, a takeoff on the Playboy Club, anyone remember the Blue Bunny? How were you allowed in? You were not old enough, Marie Fricker. Um, Chris, so, yes. I played in a band as a blue bunny. That was our team. No, you didn't. <laughs> the Nomads. The Nomads. Yeah. What year would that have been? Yeah, in the uh, 70s. You're kidding. Oh. Wow. Blue bunny, I remember. So you know who else played in the Blue Bunny? Uh, Judy Garland was visiting Boston. There's a picture of Judy coming up. I don't think it's next. Um, she was there visiting with her son, Joey Luft, and someone else, not Liza. Um, but she was, at, she was in the, the Blue Bunny. It was late 1960s. You remember that? I was her bodyguard. You were her bodyguard? So were you there when she performed? No. Aha. Uh -huh. Oh, you're kidding? No. 
That's, so we often, I wondered, I would heard the story from two different people and I'm always like, did she really sing? Her daughter was up on the stage singing and playing like dancing. You're kidding. So not Liza, Lorna? Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh. Lorna left. And uh, Joey uh, was her son. Judy couldn't get it. What's that? Judy could not do that at that time. Ah, okay. So there was, but it, it was actually mentioned in uh, the, yeah. the and Lenny one of the Hirsch ended up there. <laughs> Did he sing as well? Oh, everything. <laughs> so, so as you can see, the Blue Bunny was a place where a lot of fun things happened. Um, we remember a lot about the, the rides changed names from the, the Red Mill, the Congo Cruise, the Bermuda Triangle. As the ride itself didn't change, this structure was the same from 1917, but the, the scenery actually really didn't change that much either. Um, but we tried to change the names to keep current. At one time, this is from 1984, Paragon's coaster, the giant coaster, was number six on the Smithsonian Institution's top ten coasters. Um, kind of no neat. I'm not sure what they used to judge that. <laughs> or if it even was real, because how would you know? Uh, everyone remember Paragon, the golf land? Und it went right under the roller coaster, the, one of the scariest miniature golf courses in, <laughs> around. Every day was bargain day, well, except Sunday. Um, but that was, if you remember, anyone remember, you'd, you'd clip the uh, bargain to pass to the bottom of your shirt, would get you into every ride. Uh, okay, so we'll talk about Judy again. Hollywood, there she is on the roller coaster. Uh, well, it was right towards the end, you know. But, so, the comet. So, the people ask, why, is, why did it say the comet? It was the giant coaster. It always was the giant coaster. Well, in, so we talked about that fire in 1963 that destroyed the back of the roller coaster. What well, also destroyed this building was, that was rebuilt, which housed all the, the roller coaster cars. So they, had, no, they had, a, had to rebuild and also had to figure out what to do to get new roller coaster cars. At the same time, in a strange coincidence, in Kentucky, a, um, I think it was the Highlands Amusement Park, had a fire on their roller coaster built by the same company, used the same trains. It was called the Comet. They just decided not to rebuild their roller coaster and sold the cars to Paragon. Why they didn't take the name off the front, I will never know. It's, it drove me nuts looking at all of these things because it still says the Comet everywhere you look. Um, but there's Joey, that's Joey Luft, um, Judy's son. Pat O'Brien was one of the visitors. Anyone know who that is? Of course it is. With, on the comet. I have to tell you, this was, we shared this, this photo on Facebook. We shared a ton of photos on Facebook over the years. This one got the most likes, the most shares, and the most comments. So Frankie still got it. Connie Francis. Uh, Gabby Hayes and Rex Trailer rode the old mine train. <laughs> Scared some kids when they went by with the little pop guns. Um, and then the other great part, these aren't famous kids, this is just kids on, on the teacups, but one of the things I wanted to mention was when Paragon was auctioned, people bought everything. They wanted some piece of, of Paragon. And so people, I don't know why the teacups were broken up. I don't know why that is, but there are people all over the South Shore that own these teacups. <laughs> and 30 years later, two people didn't know what to do with them and uh, said so we got a phone call one day I have a teacup from Paragon Park and I'm thinking the little ones that you buy in the, the gift shop I said well great bring it down <laughs> and she said no you have to come get it I don't know what she was talking about so we went we got it and we're uh, South Shore Votech is restoring it. Uh, so it's going to be out front. There is one that's out there that's sort of in okay shape. You can, you can sit in it and we put an umbrella in it, but there's one that really needs some work, so they're going to use it as a project. So again, if you have a teacup lying around, <laughs> Carmel Cushing uh, and some of his friends. So one of the great things about the Cardinal was that he would celebrate his birthday in August every year, bringing kids from, if you're familiar at all with Hall, there's a Sunset Point vacation camp. Uh, where kids from the city come and they spend two weeks, go to the beach. They used to come to Paragon a few times, but on the Cardinals' Day, he would bring them all 
And uh, one kid dared him once to uh, ride the roller coaster in the front seat, and he did it. He, and then he started doing it every year. Also went on the whip, apparently, <laughs> with the nuns. Love that. OK, so here he is with Mrs. Stone. So this, it, I talked about David Stone, uh, Larry Stone's father. That's uh, Rose Stone, which was David Stone's wife, Larry's mother. David Stone died in the 1940s. And eventually, over the course of time, I'm kind of consolidating things, they bought out the Goldens. They didn't, um, uh, Albert Golden was concentrating on uh, the Black Rock House. He had a, a hotel in Boston as well. Um, so the Stones owned Paragon. Mrs. Stone, she was 90 years old. She was still every day going out ringing the bell, right? You can tell me this, right? And, and do at work every day and meeting the Cardinal every day. So she was very active until there were articles written about how, you know, Grandma runs the amusement park. And she did. She ran the amusement park. This is Larry and his wife, Phyllis. They owned Paragon after um, Mrs. Stone passed away in the late 1960s. Remember, Phyllis Stone, she'll come up a few times later on. Um, but this was uh, the couple that owned it. The Stone family owned it. They lived in Hull. Um, and they had a, a couple of children that you would think that everybody would be great if your parents owned Paragon Park, wouldn't it? Uh, but their children were not interested in the business. So Cardinal um, Medeiros, right? Cardinal Medeiros Day, of course. Um, after Cardinal Cushing uh, passed away, Cardinal Medeiros took up his um, daily, or I'm sorry, annual trip. They asked him to ride the roller coaster, and he absolutely refused. He held up his rosary beads, said, no way. He did do the power of strength, though. That was his one little thing that he would do. I think there's also a picture of him riding the boat in the, the uh, Bermuda Triangle, but that was about it. So this is now going to be a little bit of Paragon that we remember from the old days. Who remembers George? Guess your weight. Guess your age. I, I'm going to repeat myself here, but you see this scale? Somebody called us up and said, hey, I have the scale from Paragon Park. I said, what scale do you mean? They said, that big one. Uh, so the Carousel Museum has that scale. Um, George started out at Paragon. He was, but aside from Larry Stone, the owner, whose father owned it, George worked there the longest. Uh, he started out in the early 1930s, or uh, late 1920s, sorry, collecting the 10 cent admission. Um, and then when they stopped collecting the admission, they said, well, I don't know, George, we don't have a job for you. Um, what are you going to do? And he said, I'll guess people's age, and I'll guess their weight. And he set up a stand, and he did that for 50 years. Um, <laughs> And he was so, pretty accurate too. He, yeah, he was. Um, he was a great guy, great guy. Uh, there were some um, problems, uh, not a, not a lot, but people did uh, fall from the coaster. Everyone that we found has been the result of not a mechanical issue, but somebody doing something stupid, um, standing up, getting outside of the lap belt, that sort of thing. Um, those things can happen. So this is what it looked like. This is how this was the, my view when I was starting to walk up. Yeah. This is yeah. I still get at it though. Chris, how tall was it? Ninety-eight feet. So by comparison, the uh, condominium building that's there now is seventy. So it was even twenty-eight feet taller than that. They you, did when it was built originally. It was higher, and it was so dangerous they had to cut the hill down. So it wouldn't, be, it wouldn't go as fast when you can, yeah. So this is what it looked like very late, uh, late 1970s. Little, this building was destroyed in the blizzard of 1978. So this is probably early, mid 1970s. The Blue Bunny here, Al, that's where you were. Uh, the Indy 500, if everyone remembers that. That was the car race that went around. The Caterpillar, that was the thing that came over you, right? Um, let's see, what else can we see here? There's a lot that, it, oh, um, this was, this, well, this was, I think was the Galaxy, which replaced the Wild Mouse, very similar to the Wild Mouse, though. Uh, same, same type of thing, a wooden, uh, sorry, metal roller coaster that went around. This building on the side here was the original, the only building that existed uh, from the original 1905 park when Paragon closed in 1984. We tried to save it, we tried to save it, we tried to save it, we couldn't save it. Um, but we saved the carousel, so I think we did 
we did okay. Remember this view? You came around the corner at, at George Washington Boulevard and this is what you saw. Um, one of the great things from where we lived, we could see out down along this way. Uh, there was always a March of Dimes walkathon every year. And as soon as those kids turned the corner, you would see them run because they, could, they knew they were in the final stretch of getting over there. They had walked all the way from Quincy to get here. So, yeah, oh yeah, no, they were tortured, those poor kids. Some of the car rides that we had in the old days, that was the Indy 500, right? One more time around the track, no bumping on this ride. This is not the bumper cars. The, there's the Caterpillar, right there. And the, you would go around in the circle and then the thing would come over you. Anyone still have any of these laying around in their drawer? Tons of these, matchbooks. If, when you opened it, you got $2 off of your tickets. These were the tickets to have. These were the, the purple tickets. That, uh, so there's a joke from the, um, from the play, from the, the musical, that's actually true. That one of the reasons Paragon didn't make that much money in the end was that Larry gave away all the tickets. Because these would get you on every ride. Um, and there was, the, in, the, in the show they say, Phyllis, the woman playing Phyllis, his wife, said, um, he keeps giving away all the tickets, I don't know what we're gonna do, so I hid them. And they said, well, where did you hide them? And I said, well, I hid them on the desk in the office. And they said, well, why'd you put it there? He goes, well, that's where you go to do work. So Larry will never find them, because he's <laughs> never in the office, never doing any work. Because he was always out, he was always out talking to people and giving to people, and, and handing out the tickets. Anyone have any of these? Yeah. I'm saving up for that stupid radio, and they, they closed. So in the years later, we worked, um, I worked in the Penny Arcade out in front. You don't know how many people came in with these trying to turn them in. They didn't know what else to do with them. Don't tell my boss, but we took a lot of them because I thought, give me some of those. I'll take them. There's the comet. So they did, in the later years, put the Paragon Park above it but still left the stupid comment on it. I don't know why. Still don't know why. This is the end. So that when I talked about standing in my mother's backyard and hearing the, the coaster screech, this is the turn where it would come back, and this is where you would hear it. For the bicentennial, they painted it red, white, and blue. Very nice. The Kooky Castle. That was built in the, in the 60s. What I love about this picture is that it was, this was built in 1963 four after the 1963 fire. This picture was taken in 1984 and it still said the all new. <laughs> it hadn't been due in 20 years, but that would mean you'd have to change the sign. Remember this guy? Uh, so, oh wait, no, I thought, oh, blew me away. Okay, right, so Bermuda Triangle, that was the next, that was the, um, the Congo cruise, the Red Mill. Uh, again, change the face, change the name. I don't think the little scenes in the tunnels changed at all, uh, but we wanted to keep up on the times. The Devil's Mansion and the shooting gallery, who worked at the shooting galleries, right? Um, this was over on the side. This was sort of like a little fun house that you go through. So this was taken up from the sky ride, like the ski lift ride, looking down. The Trabant was this, it was like a, uh, like a top. It would turn as you went around, and I think that is, the tip top, which also spun around. The kitty rides, those were moved over a little bit. They always had a little kitty carousel. Labor Day, Jerry Lewis, you had to wait really late at night in order to see them present the Paragon check. I think it was on at like two in the morning. Um, but that's Chuck Curtis from Channel 5. Um, and some of the, when I do this talk in Hull, these kids, some of these kids were in the audience. They, uh, they recognized themselves. So it's kind of cool. This is what Paragon looked like so in 1984. This picture was actually taken in 1984. Um, this sign was the, the entrance. That was all you got, and you got these six flagpoles um, and the, the large um, hill in the back. The sky ride, that's the one we took, just saw the picture that we took looking down. And then this is George's stand right here. And then not here, but on the other side was the place where you'd pitch the dime into the cups. Sometimes you get the little cups of the glass ashtrays, which I think is great about the ashtrays. Yep. The rotor. Yeah. The one that the. You, and then the floor dropped out from below you. Yep. 
that's still, uh, it's not the one from Paragon, but this, the same ride is at Canopy Lake Park in uh, New Hampshire. What's that? No, it's gone? It died. It died? <laughs> it died? Okay. It almost took out two on the ride beside that. Oh. Had a big fire burning the ground. Oh, okay. So that's no longer there. But same, same idea. I don't think I will. Thank you. All right, taken from Jake's across the way. Well, not, not really from Jake's, but this is the view you'd get from Jake's. Um, and then Midway, Snackarama, the rides, everything you'd see. Uh, the carousel kitchen, that replaced the, that was not, didn't replace Joseph's. Joseph's moved down this way. Um, but that was when the, um, this was owned by the folks who owned Paragon. They, uh, they operated that themselves. And then the arcade. Yeah, that's right. These folks bought the carousel kitchen sign. So that was it. All those letters. You still got them, right? Okay. Keep them in good shape. We're going to check back with you on that. I don't know what happened to these signs. This sign in particular. What? Well, he took it down for that silly condo, but that was Myron That one was. Yep. I wish the man Here? For the games? Pop the balloon, right? Pull yeah, the string. Stupid balloon thing. <laughs> <laughs> the first one all day was the uh, little guys with the goldfish in them. Yeah. Oh, you and win the goldfish. And the cat rack was in that one, and that's cat why the doors all messed up because they had to change the doors because they were falling off. Yeah. <laughs> and they put the door up and it came down in his head. <laughs> <laughs> so this leads us into the next question. <laughs> Thank you for that segue. That was beautiful. Why did Paragon close? That's the question that I often get. So there were. What's that? Did you get an answer? I've got three answers for you. Okay. One of them is what you just talked about: the cost of deferred maintenance. Uh, it was very expensive to operate an amusement park. Mm -hmm. There also was in 1984. So we're now we're talking about summer 1984. Um, the in 1984 in New Jersey there was a fire at Great Adventure. Um, in a fun house where eight teenagers were killed uh, because they couldn't get out uh, before the fire happened. So as a result of that, insurance costs for all amusement parks, not just the fun house type rides, not just the dark rides as they call them, went through the roof. You couldn't get, uh, they, there were articles we've read that said insurance premiums doubled, tripled. You've got the longest, fastest roller coaster in the world, quadrupled. Um, amazingly expensive to operate. Deferred maintenance comes into play. And then the third piece was, remember we talked about Larry Stone, born in 1919. In 1984, he was 65 years old and ready to retire. Uh, his wife was around the same age. Um, oh, I got to step back a few, a few years. Uh, Larry and Phyllis got divorced in 1978, still managed to own the park 50-50. So you, you let, add that layer on of, I'm ready to retire. We've got ownership that's you know, split between us. Our children, they had two children. Uh, one was a doctor, one was a teacher. They were not interested in taking over. They had seen how hard their parents worked, how hard their grandparents worked. They weren't interested in the park. Um, without a family member to turn it over to, they were interested in hearing what other people had to say. There were people who looked at it to, to keep it as an amusement park. Um, it was expensive, again, because of those reasons that we talked about. Um, and then um, a condominium developer who had a summer home. The, the Stones lived on O Street in Hull. A condominium developer named Chester Kahn had a summer house on P Street in Hull. And had told them at one point, if you're ever interested in selling, I'm interested in buying. And they always said, oh, yeah, yeah whatever, whatever, whatever. Uh, one, he happened to come by and say, I'm still interested if you're still interested, if you're ever interested. And they said, well, let's talk. And they did. And they came up with an agreement to sell in December of 1984. So the park was closed. Nobody knew that it had closed for good because the season was over. And they announced that they were going to have one last season in 1985. Uh, and that was great. You know, people were sad, but hey, we're going to have one last season. It's going to be great. Well. The real estate market was such that it was that the developer got antsy, wanted to get shovels in the ground faster than, than waiting another year. Um, and also, they started to get a little worried about what people might do 
in the last year, knowing it's the last year of the park, I'm going to try and steal something off of here or grab this. And they were concerned. So they, they moved the closing date up to March of 1985, and the park was sold without a final year. This is Phyllis Stone. I mentioned her before. Again, things people find in their attic. Someone not related to the Stone family, a friend of the Stone family, found a video that they had shot. Um, you can see it's winter, so it's over the winter after they had decided to sell, that they took a video and just kind of walked around a little bit, showed some scenes of the park, showed the office, and then Mrs. Stone took her time card and went over and punched out for the last time. So that's a, uh, the still from that from March of 1985. The park was auctioned in June. One by one, each one was auctioned. There were people there from, at this time, uh, Whalen Park was still open, Lincoln Park was still open, um, a few others were still around. So this attracted a lot of attention, a lot of people who were buying uh, amusements. The old train was actually purchased by a guy from Hong Kong. And as we've seen, a lot of people were around bought things, uh, bought signs, bought pieces of, of the park. This was painted by Ann Kinnear, who was an artist who was uh, my mentor in history uh, and an awesome painter. She kind of combined, you know, if you watched our slideshow, we've got the old you know, entrances, the, the new, the gone ones, and then she put right in the middle that sign. This is a great painting. The person who bought this painting from her in 1985 donated it back to the carousel, to the auction, and fundraiser, which was really cool. And I got all the But I'm not there. Things that he built, things that he loved, uh, 
and said, when you guys go and bid on Carousel, keep it in mind. They said, great, where are we going to put it? She said, I don't know. I said, okay, how much do you think it's going to go for? I don't know. How are we going to do this? I don't know. Will you guys do it? And they said, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll give it a go. We'll give it a shot. So one guy was charged with going to the bank and getting a letter of credit. So you bring a letter of credit to the auction. And they looked around, they did some research, and the last carousel was sold for $400,000. Uh, yeah, six months before, something like that. So he said, all right, I think $500,000 is We should be safe if we get a letter of credit for $500,000. They all agreed they were going to ship in whatever they were going to do among the three of them. And they go. He goes, he's going to go to the bank. It's a Saturday morning. And he gets a feeling, strange feeling, that something wasn't right. Just on the at the last minute said, you know what? Add another hundred thousand to that letter. I just feel like I can do it. So he did, didn't tell anybody that he'd done it, but he had it in his pocket. Go to the auction, people are bidding, how are you going to The minimum bid for the auction, remember now, you've got a letter of credit in his pocket for six hundred thousand dollars. They auction everything, add it all up, add twenty percent. What's the minimum bid? Five hundred and ninety-eight thousand. Oh. 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 His two partners thought they lost. They didn't. They, they had no idea that they'd done it. And so the auctioneer does this thing. So again, you've got a picture of the scene now. There's people in there who are buying. There's people in there who are annoyed and protesting and don't want to be there. And the auctioneer says, "All right, we're auctioning the entire thing. Um, do we have any bids?" Higher room silence. And over in the corner, we have a cookout. This is the guy, Dan Kirkman, who had that feeling that he needed it. This is his partner, Paul Hammond. And this guy in the back, you can't see him, I wish the picture was clearer, is, does anyone remember Senator Bill Bolton? Oh, sure. from, from this area, which is our state senator. His grandfather was Albert. Oh, my God. He got the place, he got the state to give the land and put the carousel on so they could find him. So he bids $598,800. People go crazy because they see who it is and they see that there's tall people around and they, they still don't know what's happening. But they look. And so it's awesome. Because you can see people that cheer. They don't even know what's going on. They cheer. The auctioneer gets to the point, to, gets to it and says, okay, we have a bid. So he reads the letter of credit, says $600,000. Do we have any other bids? And again, Room is silent, and nobody says anything. So he says, "All right, going once, going twice." And then he, we have a video of this, and I watched the video, and I didn't understand it until I did a little more research. But he turns and he says, "John, do you want?" And then he turns, and the video, the camera's on him, so you can't see what happens. Over here. And then he gallops down and they wait. Now I thought that was just the auctioneer that he was showing. You know, he'd been around, he's doing all this, and he you know, points to some guy in the audience and says, hey, John, do you want this? Turns out there was a guy standing there with a million dollars. I tracked him down. I found out who he was. He was from Ohio. They were the town of Richmond, Ohio. If you look it up, they now have a, they have a free carousel. They went crazy. They wanted to have a carousel in their, in their downtown. He came from Ohio to buy it. He had a million dollar letter of credit in his pocket. The auctioneer knew it, knew what he was there to do, and was actually asking, and they told me later that someone else who was there said that he actually you know, shook his head, no, he didn't want it. Because he told Dan, if you guys run out, I won't bid, but if you guys run out of money, I'm gonna bid it. I'm gonna it. So the, the one thing about it was at least it would have been together if it had gone to Ohio. So these guys, they, they gavel him down, they get him there, and they bring him up to the table. And he says, okay, you know, people are clearing out the news media is all doing their thing. They're signing the paperwork. He says, okay, 598,800 plus uh, 5% sales tax. Oh. Oh. And the three of them look at each other and say, well, now what? Who comes and saves the day? That same activist who got them all together. She was the executive director of the Life City Museum. Oh. She said, oh no, 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 they're buying it on behalf of the museum, which happens to be
ourselves as safe, but again, what do we do? He's in the middle of the park, waiting to go somewhere. And so you get a truck under it and you pick it up. Now, this made it under Ripley's, believe it or not, if you actually pick up a building. Oh, by the way, the building was not included. Oh, wow. The dog was like, ah, it's safe. Oh my God. So they, they actually had the option if they wanted to, they could have taken the building down. But they wanted to move the whole thing. So they took the horses off, put the beams through, and picked it up. Well, as they're driving, they're driving and driving and driving, and they get stuck in the mud. They could get it out for a long time. They eventually, so it's raining again. <laughs> so we're trying to get it over to where, where it is now, but we know it is now. Well, that, that was flooded. We couldn't do that. So we had to leave it across the street for a few days. So we might have to drive down there and there's this carousel and it's sitting there. We're driving down the street. Again, crazy. Uh, so here are the three guys. So that's Dan Frigmore, the guy that's holding up the sign. That's Paul. This other guy was Dan Levin. Remember Dream Machine uh, Arcade that was there, um, two mm -hmm. other things, all of course. Dan on that. Uh, so he's one of the bidders. And then this guy right here is Bill Geary, who was the um, commissioner of what was then the NBC Commissioner. He actually came to the uh, uh, company theater show the other night to the picture of this guy. So this is what the clock tower used to look like. I don't know if everyone remembers this, but it was a building that was derelict and old. And When you go there, as I mentioned, if you can see in here the uh, workshop of James Hardison, who is the Carousel Restoration Artist. Um, this is the lean force. So remember I mentioned that the chariots were very rare and very valuable. This is what's called the lean force of Carousel. It has teeth that you can see the whole thing. PTC, Philadelphia Logging Company, is the shield. This is when you have a, a horse, a carousel. Horses are numbered. This is horse number one. Carry the shield. For years it was painted white because what they used to do was just slap it and put a paint on it. If you had something you had to do during the winter, you couldn't strip the paint out of every horse. He took the, the horse, uh, the paint down to the original color of the horse. That was the original paint. Um, he was presenting us at one of the uh, end of the week that they had. I have a picture that I took the other day. Of that horse? Yep. That's awesome. Yep. The chariot is now. And being I have the chariot restored. too. Yeah, the, the one of the chariot was restored, and now the next one is being restored. Those are expensive. We look for sponsors for those. Um, this is just quickly the, the coaster in Maryland. If you go, I didn't take a picture because I haven't been there. Uh, but this is what you see when you get on the giant coaster. That's sort of to show you where it was. That's it in Maryland. It looks a little less scary than it did at Paragon. I don't know if it shakes as much as it did. <laughs> okay, so let's just, uh, we'll finish up with the musical. As we mentioned, it's sold out again in the second run. Uh, but Scott Wally was the original George Lodge. And look at the scene. This is amazing. I thought when I first saw this, I thought they took a piece of carousel. And they recreated that in a beautiful, beautiful way. Uh, again, we mentioned to pay attention to Mrs. Stone. This is Mrs. Stone, uh, just before she passed away. These two are the writers of the musical. Uh, Michael Hammond wrote, Zoe Bradford wrote, and Adam Rohde wrote the music. If you hear the music, those are all original songs written by a guy who was born out the Paranormal. So it's amazing that they were captured just from interviews with Mrs. Stone and from interviews with some of the other folks that they had. Mrs. Stone passed away. As I mentioned, the museum is there, please do uh, visit. Myron Klein, some people may remember Myron, if you ever worked at the park, if you worked probably for Myron. Um, he donated a lot of his memorabilia, a lot of his memories. Um, he had a carousel collection of, of, of all sorts of stuff. Great guy, very, very good guy. He told me a lot of stories that, you know, when I said I had to say, well, those real, those are my stories, because they were, they, they were probably, they sounded so all managed, they couldn't be. <laughs> Well, let's finish up with, if you go there now, what used to be there. This, is, I think, is the most useful. So when we take the next trip to Nantasket, look and see what you got. So this is what the Midway used to look like, right? That was when you walk in, you walk in the back gate, you look right out at the roller coaster. Yeah. This is what it looks like now. <laughs> it's the retention pit for the condominium. The island, not really that interesting, but the roller coaster would be right here. This is the curve at the end. 